Hello Fiber friends and welcome to the Jillian Eve channel. I'm Evie and I spin yarn and I make stuff from yarn and today I am beginning a history bounding cape adventure and I'm starting this adventure by using this magical Viking spindle whirl. Seriously, this is a charm written in Norse runes on this spindle whirl. I can't wait to tell you all about this. I've done a ton of research and I am getting into a project that will span several videos. So this is the first in a series and I can't wait to tell you all about all of it. So let's get spinning. Last September, my friend Shannon hosted a sew along on her YouTube channel, Shannon Makes. Her channel is fantastic. She has wonderful projects. So seriously, you should go check her out. I really wanted to participate in the Cape Timber so long, but I have a self-imposed rule for my projects, which is that I must incorporate hand spun yarn into all of my projects. And between moving and Vlogmas last September, I had no time to spin an entire Cape's worth of yarn to weave and sew the time involved. It just wasn't feasible. The Cape project never stopped percolating in the back of my mind though. So here and there, I gathered materials for this project. A bolt of clearance fabric here, a few yards of inspiration there, a simplicity pattern I found during a pattern sale, some beautiful Lester long wool locks sent to me by Lori from Heritage Lester's, and a magical Viking spindle whirl brought it all together. I want to start my project with the foundation of all my projects. For me, that is the spinning. And so I am going to spin and weave a collar trim piece for this cape. And I'm going to incorporate these gorgeous long wool locks, sort of Verifelder inspired F cloth to attach to this cape and maybe if I have extra I'll do some trim with that as well. And yes, this really is a magical Viking spindle whirl. So let's start by talking about the history of this spindle whirl and then we will do some spinning with it. This spindle whirl is a replica of a whirl discovered in England that dates back to the 11th century. I purchased this whirl from Living Past UK. The original whirl was discovered in 2010 by a local metal detectorist in Salt Fleetby, which is in Lincolnshire, England. The original whirl is made of lead. However, mine is made of lead-free pewter. I'm okay with not having lead all over my fingers and also not dinging it up every time I drop it. Lead spindle whirls are fairly common, and perhaps that's partly due to the fact that, for one, they're easily detectable by metal detectors, and two, they haven't rotted away like wood or other organic types of materials can in the ground. But the thing that's really remarkable about this particular spindle whirl is that it has Norse runes carved onto the side and the top surface of the spindle whirl. Since I have no idea how to read Norse runes, <laughs> I journeyed through the internet for some expert analysis. This whirl was first analyzed by Dr. John Hines, who is a professor at Cardiff University. He specializes in archeology span of the early medieval period. I have his full paper linked below. There have also been some other interpretations presented of this world, so if you really want to geek out on the analysis of this, please go check that out. In his analysis, Dr. Hines determined that the writing on it was meant to be a magic charm. In his paper, he writes, we can imagine that the action of spinning the whirl on which this charm was written was conceived of as a movement that activated the text and so made the statement a reality. It enacted the charm. So what does this magic charm say and what is it intended to do? The translation of the runes is this. Odin and Heimdall and Thalva, they help the Ulfjotr followed by another untranslatable word. 
The last bit has a number of possible interpretations, but without further context, it's unclear exactly what it was meant to say. The first part though is clear. The runes are calling on three Norse deities. Odin is the Allfather, the god of warriors and battle, but also of magic, poetry, and wisdom, especially connected to rune magic. Heimdall guards Asgard, home of the gods, against invading enemies. He was said to have such incredible hearing that he could hear wool growing on sheep. He's connected with sheep, particularly with rams, and is also seen as a symbol of fertility. Thalva is mentioned in Norse mythology as being a boy who and he and his sister were servants to the god Thor. These three deities then are helping the spinner and perhaps somebody else who's named to do something. That last bit without further context, it's unclear what the meaning of that last part was meant to be. It's also the part that's written the most sloppily, which could be on purpose, or it could be because they were writing around and uh, started to realize, oh, I don't have a lot of room left. I better cram this word in there. <laughs> People problems. Um, so it's unclear what that last bit means, but it looks as if this charm was meant to ask these three deities to help the spinner do something. There could be a translation of the verb to make, so perhaps to make yarn. Another part of the speculation was to make children or babies, and with Heimdall being connected with sheep, but also with fertility, it's unclear the direction that was gonna go, or perhaps they just wanted more lambs in the spring. Um, we don't really know. <laughs> there are other Norse rune inscribed objects that have been discovered from the Viking period, and they are also presumed to have been charms that were meant to enact some sort of help or assistance for the person who was using or reading or wearing the charm. And many of those have purposely obscured uh, sections or words uh, with the writing being sometimes upside down, reversed, different directions, written sloppily, and sometimes with the runes superimposed on top of each other. So the thought is that perhaps they were intentionally obscure or difficult to read so that the meaning would only be known fully to the person who was using them. So what do you think? Did they run out of room to write the rest of their sentence? Or was this obscure for a some sort of esoteric or magical purpose? I know that this is just all speculation. I'm not a rune translation expert. If you are, I would love to hear your knowledge shared. Please let us know down in the comments. I think we've rambled on enough about this whirl and the writing on it. Let's put it on a spindle stick and do some spinning. The wool that I'm spinning is Cheviot. Cheviot is a long wool breed originating in the Cheviot Hills on the border of England and Scotland. The breed Cheviot was first documented in 1372. That is a few hundred years after the dating of this spindle whorl, but for the breeds available to me, I think that Cheviot is a very close choice and comparable to what wool would have been available to the spinner at that time that they were using this spindle whorl. I am using a distaff to hold this wool while I spin, which would have been the technique used for a spindle of this type. I prepared the wool by carding it, and then I fluffed it open and tied it to my distaff with a handwoven band. Now we have to address this question. Would this distaff be held by being tucked into the belt, or would it be handheld or tucked into the arm? I went looking for any information I could find about distaff usage in this time period in this location. The closest thing I could find was the copper gate finds from Viking York, which wasn't too far away from Salt Fleetby, and I kind of went with it because there's just not that much information about 
distaffs from this time period, especially because they were wood, like the spindle shafts, many of them have just decayed over time. The one from Coppergate suggests that it would have either been handheld or tucked under the arm. The iconic medieval uh, tucked into the belt kind of distaff seems to have been more popular later on in the medieval period, this early medieval period, especially for this part of England that was so influenced by Scandinavian culture, would have very likely used a handheld or a shorter form of a distaff. It makes sense that this area would have been more influenced by the Scandinavian types of textile tools because this area was colonized by, by Vikings and it's the reason that we are reading Norse runes on a spindle whorl that was found in England. Making that connection, I feel like it's appropriate to use a handheld distaff when spinning with this particular spindle. My handheld distaff also happens to be within a few um, millimeters of the length of the distaff found at Coppergate. So, I think we're fairly in line with possibly the form factor of distaff that would have been paired with a spindle like this. The shaft that came with this spindle when I ordered it is a straight stick with a notch carved into the top of it, but because uh, the top of this is just kind of flat and dowel diameter, it wobbled quite a bit while I was spinning. This kind of notch works well for more of a fully suspended drop spindle kind of a spin, um, but the shape of the spindle whorl didn't quite work so well. So I was able to spin a full cop with the Cheviot wool, and um, obviously I made it work, but it had a lot of wobble and it just didn't feel very efficient. I had to keep giving it more and more twist to keep the spin going. Each burst I gave it got a lot of twist, but that twist didn't maintain for a long time. So it needed to constantly have more twist added. And so that makes me think that a clasped or in hand type of spinning would make more sense for this particular spindle whorl. If we look at the spindle shafts from Coppergate, uh, they are tapered at both ends and some of them have a spiral carved into the tip as opposed to a notch like this. And that makes much more sense for a clasped or in-hand spin. So fortunately, I do have a spindle shaft in that form factor from Hershey Fiber Arts with a lovely spiral carved in the tip of it. And it is tapered at both ends. This spindle whorl fits very well on this spindle shaft. So I feel like this is the way to go. I want to show you something about this spindle whorl that is so cool. And I only discovered it after actually using it to spin with. This type of plano conical spindle whorl shape is used with the flat side facing the cob of yarn. That means that looking at the writing head on on the spindle, it will appear to be written upside down. However, from the perspective of the spinner while spinning, the writing is oriented right side up, suggesting perhaps it's intended to be read by the spinner herself. Maybe she's even the one who carved it that way. Spinning with a strong long wool breed makes using this whorl possible. If I was trying to spin something delicate and fluffy, I feel like there would be a serious struggle to keep the integrity of the yarn without spinning it much thicker.
I'm able to produce a range of thicknesses with this spindle, but I wanted to go for something that would have been what the Scandinavian or Anglo-Scandinavian people would have been spinning at this time with this type of a spindle whirl. There's not a whole lot of surviving textiles to look for. Luckily, I have this book called Medieval Garments Reconstructed Norse Clothing Patterns. It analyzes the textile finds from Viking settlements that existed from the 10th to 15th centuries in Greenland. And because the book shows that even in remote Greenland, people were adhering to the European fashion standards of their time, I'm going with the information here that says the warp threads averaged one millimeter in diameter and had 40 to 45 degrees of twist angle. So let's see how my yarn measures up. There are about 25 millimeters per inch. That means that spinning the yarn to about 25 wraps per inch is going to be about one millimeter and it looks like that's right where I'm at. I think we're a little too big there, a little narrow there. I think we're good. When we look at the twist angle, this is really hard to see on the camera, but when I get really up close with it, it looks like I'm at about a 45 degree angle of twist. So this is perfect. This is exactly what the warp threads are averaging out for um, the fabric that was analyzed in the book. And if I compare, they're both running about the same the same yarn. So it's clear that spinning with intentionality means that you'll be able to produce whatever kind of yarn you want to produce using various types of equipment, but I'm just having so much fun exploring all of these different possible techniques and combinations of historic equipment. Of course, there's no possible way that we can 100% know for sure uh, we can just use our best guesses, but I'm just having so much fun exploring all of this. My next steps for this project will be to create a mock-up and make sure that the cape fits how I want it to, and then to sew the cape itself with the commercial uh, fabric that I have. And at that point, I'll be able to check and see exactly where I want the trim to go and how wide I want the trim to be. Extant textiles show us that people, especially for home production, would weave the cloth to the width that they needed it to be for their intended purpose. And I am 100% with them. I do not want to cut off my hand spun, hand sewed, um, hand woven selvages just to sew them, to hem them up again. Like that doesn't make any sense. So I will be weaving to the width I need and to figure that out, I need to do the cape first. So that's where I'm headed with that. When I do the weaving for this project, my plan is to incorporate these amazing luster locks in sort of a Vera Felder inspired collar. So these will be incorporated into the weaving to um, be the collar and maybe some of the trim on this cape. It's gonna be very fancy and I can't wait. I will definitely have more videos coming up showing each step of this process. So, you know, if you haven't already, subscribe, hit like, share this video with your friends who like to geek out on uh, spindle whirls, and I will see you next time. So in the meantime, happy spinning.